and accuracies on that first case that we Just need to say, bring it up. Councilman Hunt over here. Call a meeting to order. Bob, is there any changes to the um, agenda? Uh, yes, there's a revised agenda that is at your desk. Okay, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Need approval. Hunter, uh, did you have something on the minutes? You wanted to St St staff was going to recommend deferral one meeting of the minutes. Uh, there was some co comments that we heard, some inaccuracies that we were going to look at, and okay. so staff was going to recommend deferral one meeting. Okay, the minutes of April 23rd, 2015 will be deferred uh, one meeting. If I'd like a motion for that to make sure it's official. So moved. Sure. Motion second to defer the minutes of April 23rd, 2015. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, council members, I believe, saw Councilman Bedney. Would you like to speak? Thank you. I was just trying to catch up on the agenda. <laughs> You're uh, up. So uh, I was here to uh, speak on support on some uh, legislations in my district and also something that we are doing around the city. Uh, we have a. Uh, uh, the National College sign issue that it's uh, on the consent agenda and I'm supporting that. We had a community meeting and uh, there was no opposition. It was, it came really good. So that's, that's a good one. Uh, then uh, the next one that I was uh, hoping that you will consider supporting is our legislation to, uh, to improve how we do school siting around Nashville. This is a process that I started many years ago and got the involvement of uh, the design center and, and the different departments. And it, it's going to help uh, Nashville to do a better job siting schools uh, where they need to be, which right now artificially they end up in really bad places without good infrastructure. So I'm here to support that as well. And then there is a, a pad that is uh, coming for an adjustment here. And uh, we have also had a community meeting about that one. That one is on uh, Blue Hole Road and Bell, uh, Bell Road. And uh, the community came to the meeting, the, uh, the, the developer, I mean the owners, <laughs> Uh, hosted the meeting with us and, and the community didn't have any problem with it uh, and they wanted to make sure that uh, the school uh, was part of the uh, proposal which uh, the, the owners have in indicated that they are inclined to, to do that so uh, in general there was I would say that there was no opposition okay. all right Great, thank you. You guys want me to sing or something, or this is good? No All questions. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much for your service. Any other council members that have overlooked? Okay, I guess we're ready for nice for next update. First, we're going to have uh, Jennifer Higgs is going to come up and kind of go through a little bit on the uh, uh, the web page so that you'll be familiar with it, and people that are watching this will be familiar with it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk about just two websites we put up for people to review Nashville Next. Um, this first website is so we you can compare the current community character uh, manual with the uh, pro proposed. Um, what it allows you to do is you can put in an address and locate your property, and then you can swipe back and forth between the two plans. You can zoom in to an area and see how the policy is changing from what is ex currently adopted to what will um, is proposed to be adopted with Nashville Next. And the legends are over on the side, so you can see what the different color codes mean. And you can identify on one and see what it is in the future and what it is today. So that's the first website. The second website is for public comment. 
for the growth and preservation plan? This one's a little slower to load. It's got a lot to load. If it works. Not loaded before. <laughs> of course, it's not going to work. I don't ever have to present up here, but the one time I do. I'm not sure what's going on. Like I said, I just finished this a few uh, hours ago. So the site lets you go in, and um, it, th this time, if you've ever been on the site before, it makes you requires you to put your name and email because these comments will um, be part of the public record that's read to the Planning Commission when it's adopted. Um, it allows you to go through the growth and preservation plan. It also allows you to. Um, look at detail at the community character manual. Um, I'm sorry it's not working. And it allows you to comment in all those sections. It also sends you an email to verify that you did, your comment was received. Um, so if you do make a comment and you don't get an email from it, then you probably, your comment probably didn't make it through and you need to try again. Um, this will be available on the um, planning department's webpage tomorrow morning, um, and it will not be doing this. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Thanks. Excuse me. Got a question. <laughs> Got a question. Jennifer. Let me ask you something. For the persons that are sitting out <clears throat> looking at this, can you walk them through how you get to what we just saw? Because a lot of people out there see it, but they still have a hard time getting to it if they don't know how to navigate it. Okay. If they go to the Nashville dot well, let me try that again. Mm. If you go to the Nashville Planning Department's page and go to Nashville next, it should be by t in tomorrow morning it will be um, it should be a link on the front page under the Nashville Next. So if you go to the Nashville.gov, go to the Planning Department, go to the Nashville Next um, section, and there will be a link right there to to the both websites, um, the one for you to comment and the one for you to um, review and be able to go back and forth between the existing and the, and the proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Two parts of this. Yeah, same. Sanjay, is she here? Let's see. Let's see. I was going to check one more. Oh, hi, you're hiding back there. <laughs> All right. Oh, wait. It's working on my machine, so I, <laughs> I remoted into my machine, so it's not working on this laptop. So if I can, I will show it to you. As it's loading up. So um, you have the splash screen, and you go through next. And here is where it requires you now to put, before it didn't require a name and an email, now it does, so I will put mine in there. All right, and so the, the plan comes up with the growth and preservation concept mapped at the beginning. Um, you can put in an address and uh, search for your address and zoom to your location, or you can just um, use the rollerball to pan to pan zoom in and zoom out of the map. Or if you want to, there's some map navigation tips you can click on, and um, if you like to use like a rectangle zoom, you can do it that way. 
You can then comment on any one of the sections by clicking on the map. So if you have a comment about an area, you can put it in and I'm gonna just say this is a test. And submit. And I should see in a second, which, yeah, so you'll see in a second that I just got an email came through saying that I, they did receive my comment. It gives information about when the public hearing meetings will be, and it tells me what my comment was. Um, so every time you comment, you'll get a record of what exact comment you made and in what section you made the comment. So you can step through the different sections and see the different... And there's a description about what each section was, This, is like about the li future libraries that might be needed, fire stations, park areas, and then the community character map. On the community character map, that's one section in which you can see if on a particular area somebody else already commented, you can see their comment. In all the other sections, you only see your own comments, but in this section you can see um, if anyone else has commented before. Again, it'll also send, in any section, it'll send an email. There is a legend up in the top right corner for any of the areas so you can see what one of the colors might mean. And you can zoom in to parcel level. Yeah. Right. So if we put in... I assume we can. How I thinking? I put in a valid address. No. Well, I say you can. <laughs> Let's go home. I might have to. I might have to check on that. Bernard only because I'm nervous, things aren't working here. So you can zoom into the parcel level and see um, all the way in and see what the plan calls for and zoom in and zoom out. Then it opened up on the screen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm talk a little bit about the missing metal housing and how that fits in our transition and infill areas. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Singe Saliki, and I'm with the design studio here at the planning department. Today, I'll be speaking to you about missing middle housing. <clears throat> missing middle housing is a term that was first used by architect and urban planner Dan Paralek. It describes a range of multi-unit and clustered housing types that are compatible in scale with single-family homes. Common examples of missing middle housing types include duplexes, triplexes, townhomes, manor homes, and bungalow courts. These housing types can be found in neighborhoods that were built before 1940, but they are no longer common today. Therefore, they are quote unquote missing. Missing middle housing types is a part of the larger housing conversation that we've been having throughout the Nashville Next process. Nashville Next calls for ad the addition of more housing units and more diverse housing types throughout Davidson County. Housing diversity is important for a number of reasons. First, it allows, you pe it allows people to age in place. That is the idea that you can live in one community or one neighborhood for your entire life and there, because there are housing choices there that meet your needs at each stage of your life, whether you're a college student, a working professional with a family, or an aging senior. Secondly, housing diversity affor allows for affordability because the variety of housing types are at different price points. 
finally, housing diversity meets the growing market demand for walkable urban living by millennials and baby boomers who will make up a large share of the population in Davidson County. The provision of diverse housing types throughout the county can help to support our centers and our corridors and also increase the viability for transit along our corridors. The growth and preservation concept map you see provides a high level guidance for the components of the Nashville Next General Plan, including the updated community plans and the updated community character manual. It calls for the use of strategic infill to support transit and activity centers. The land use, transportation, and infrastructure element provides an action to guide the implementation of transitions and infill. Transitions and infill are reflected in the community plans and our community character manual through updated policy, policies that include language about how to achieve transitions through the application of moderate scale policies whenever you have a very intense policy right next to a policy that is not so intense. And also through the proposed new transition policy. Missing middle housing is an important tool that can provide housing diversity and choice in transition areas along our corridors and our centers. The smaller footprints of missing middle housing types allows them to provide a transition in height, scale, and density from centers and corridors to adjacent residential neighborhoods. This diagram shows how missing middle housing types can be used to transition from a commercial corridor back into a residential neighborhood. This next diagram shows how missing middle housing types can be integrated in, within an existing residential neighborhood. Finally, these images show some examples of existing middle housing that is here in different parts of the county. Nashville Next calls for diversity, housing diversity that is tailored to the context and character of the area. Missing middle housing types can help to achieve blended densities which are in context and can also help to meet the housing in Davidson County now and in the future. The next steps for the Nashville Next process is that the complete strat static draft of the plan will be posted online on May the 18th and on June the 15th we will return here to Sunny West where we will have a public hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. Tell me about the items be deferred or withdrawn. Yes, there are several items to be deferred or withdrawn, starting with item number 1A, uh, case number 2015-CP-003-001. This is a request to amend the Bordeaux-Whites Creek Community Plan by changing the community character policy from district industrial policy to impact policy for properties located at 1311 and 1325 Vashti Street. Staff recommendation is to withdraw. The next item is 1B, the associated zone change that went with that plan amendment. This is case number 2015 SP-012-001. This is a request to rezone from IWD to SP zoning for properties located at 1311 and 1325 Vashti Street to permit the development of a concrete batch plant. Staff recommendation is to withdraw. Next item is item number two, case number 2015 SP-016-001. This is a request to rezone from MUIA to SP zoning for properties located at 1912, 1918, and 1922 Broadway to, to permit a mixed-use well, development. Excuse me just a minute. Keep hearing some uh, 
conversation in the back. It's hard for us to hear up here with that going on. If you're going to be talking, if you could take those out in the hall, we'd appreciate it. Go ahead, Bob. So item number two is the 1922 Broadway. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 28, 2015 Planning Commission meeting. Next item is number three, 2015SP-032-001. This is a request to rezone from RS5 to SP zoning for property located at 930 and 932 42nd Avenue North and 4101 and 4103 and 4105 Albion Street to permit up to 26 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Next item on the deferral list is item number four, uh, case number 128-78G-001. This is a request to amend the Hermitage Business Center Commercial <laughs> PUD Overlay District for a portion of property located at 4001 Lebanon Pike to add 1.2 acres into the, the PUD. Staff recommendation is to defer to the May 28th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is not for deferral is item number 11, case 2015 SP-046-001. This is a request to rezone from R6 to SP zoning for property located at 122, 124, and 126 Rains Avenue to permit up to nine residential dwelling units. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. And the last item on the deferral list is item 18, Case number 2015Z-026PR-001. This is a request to rezone from RS5 to MUNA zoning for property located at 1042 and 1044 Sharp Avenue. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th Planning Commission meeting. Those are all the items on the deferral and withdrawal list. Thank you, Bob. Um, Mr. Item 1A and 1B have been requested to be withdrawn. Item 2, 3, 4, 11, 18 deferred. Is there a motion to uh, take care of those items? Okay. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Items on consent. Uh, yes. Uh, before I get to the consent agenda, as information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the Planning Commission's decision to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. Please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. As notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individ individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. So as I read these items into the consent agenda, please raise your hand if you'd like one of these items removed. The first item on the consent agenda is item number five, uh, case number 2015Z-008TX-001. Uh, this is a request to amend uh, chapter 17.08 and 17.16 of Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code pertaining to community education siting and to allow community education as a permitted use in the CN, SCN, IWD, IR, and IG districts. Staff recommends approval with an amendment. Uh, the next item on the consent agenda is item number seven. This is case number 2007SP-01, 2007SP-156-001. This is a request to amend the National College SP District for property located at 1638 Bell Road to permit a digital sign. Uh, staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Next item is item eight. Uh, 2010 SP-011-002. This is a request to amend the Potter SP District to revise the building locations of the approved plan on, on property located at 7734 Highway 70 South. Staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. 
Next item on the consent agenda is on page eight of your agenda, case number, uh, item number nine, case number 2015 SP-044-001. This is a request to rezone from CS to SP zoning for property located at 1610 4th Avenue North to permit up to four residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Next item is item 10 on page eight of your agenda, case number 2015 SP-045-001. This is a request to rezone from R6 to SP zoning for properties located at 1114 and 1116 2nd Avenue South to permit up to four residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Next item on the consent agenda is item 12, 2015 SP-049-001. This is a request to rezone from SP zoning to a new SP zoning for property located at 1225 Standback Avenue to permit up to four attached residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. And I'll note on that case that Commissioner G is recusing himself. On uh, the next case is item 13, uh, 2015 SP-050-001. This is a request to rezone from RS5 to SP zoning for property located at 109 Douglas Avenue to permit up to three attached residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. And I'll note on that one that Commissioner G is recusing himself. Next item on the consent is item number 15, uh, case number 2013Z-023PR-001. This is a request to rezone from IWD to MUNA zoning for property located at 1303, 1305, 1307 Baptist World Center Drive. The staff recommendation is to approve. Next item is six, item 16, 2015Z-024PR-001. This is a request to rezone from MUL and CS zoning to MUGA zoning for properties located at 1715 and 1729 Rosa Parks Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next item is item 17, case 2015Z-025PR-001. This is a request to rezone from RS5 to RM20A uh, for various properties located at Fern Avenue and Fern Avenue Unnumbered and Elmhurst Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next item is item 19, 2015Z-027PR-001. This is a request to rezone from AR2A to RM6 and RS10 zoning for property located at Hamilton Church Road, unnumbered. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next case is item 20. 2015Z-028PR-001. This is a request to rezone from R6 to MULA zoning for various properties located along 3rd Avenue South. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next item is item 21. Case 2015Z-029PR-001. This is a request to rezone from SP to MUL zoning for property located at 350 Wallace Road. Staff recommendation is to approve. Uh, next case is item 23. 2015Z-031PR-001. Uh, this is a request to rezone from CS to MULA zoning for property located at 461 and 465 Humphrey Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next case is item 24, uh, 2015Z-032PR-001. This is a request to rezone from ON to RM20A zoning for property located at 1208 Hawkins Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next item on the consent agenda is item 25, case number 2015 P-001-001. 
this is a request to revise a resident residential PUD district uh, for property located at 501 Sylvan Street to permit a four-story 68 unit apartment building staff recommends approval with conditions next item on the consent agenda is item 26 case 28-79 P-001 uh, this is a request to revise the preliminary plan and for a portion of the Hickory Highlands PUD for property located at Rural Hill Road unnumbered to permit 107 residential units staff recommends approval with conditions Next case is item 27, 95P-025-001. This is a request to revise the preliminary plan and for final site plan approval for a portion of the Millwood Commons PUD district located at Bell Road unnumbered and 1617 Bell Road to permit up to 252 multifamily dwelling units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions, including a revised condition that's at your desk. Next item on the consent agenda is item 28, uh, case 142-66P-001. Uh, this is a request to revise the preliminary plan and for final site plan approval for the commercial PUD overlay district located at 730 Gallatin Pike to permit a 3,500 square foot building addition and canopy addition uh, to an existing 31,700 square foot building. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Next case on the consent agenda is item 29, 5-73P-002. This is a request to revise a portion of a commercial PUD for property located at 2500 Music Valley Drive to permit two hotels. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Next case is item 30, um, case 247-84P-001. This is a request to revise the preliminary plan and for final site plan approval for, for a commercial PUD for various properties located uh, along Nolensville Pike at Old Hickory Boulevard. Uh, staff recommend or to revise the use classification for portions of the existing commercial buildings. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Next case is item 31, case 2015S-038-001. This is a request for final plat approval to create two lots on property located at 998 McFerrin, <coughs> McFerrin Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. And then under other business, item 32, employee contract renewal for Bob Lehman, Leslie Meehan, uh, Doug Sloan, and an employee contract extension for Rick Bernhardt. Staff recommendation is to approve. Uh, next item is item 33, certification of bonus height compliance for 1100 Charlotte Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 34 is a memorandum of agreement between the City of Johnson City on behalf of the Johnson City MP Metropolitan Tr Transportation Planning Organization and the Nashville Davidson County MPO on, on behalf of the Nashville Area MPO for uh, sharing TIP software upgrades. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 37A is approve a revised special meeting schedule for consideration of the Nashville Next general plan as follows. Monday, June 15th, 2015, special called MPC meeting for a public hearing on the Nashville Next plan starting at 3 p.m. here in the Howard Office Building, Sunny West Conference Center. And Monday, June 22nd, 2015, special called Planning Commission meeting to consider Nashville Next at 1 p.m. Um, here at the Sunny West Conference Center. And then item 37B is uh, recommended procedures for the public hearing in consideration of the Nashville Next general plan. And item 38 is to accept the director's report and approve administrative items. Okay, Bob, thank you. Mr. Hello, Chairman. Um, I'd like, since we received a revised, uh, uh, item 37B, since we received a revised procedures for the public hearing, I'd like to pull that off consent just to make sure the commissioners are aware of any changes and the public's aware of those changes. Thank you. 
How long, Chairman? Just how long was that Bernhardt extension for, anyway? I just think we ought to know that. No more than one month. No more than one month. Just check. Okay. Bob, I'm going to read these off. There's about 26 items, so I'm going to read these off, and the commissioners will go along with the be sure we get these correct. The items that have been uh, referred to us from the staff to be on consent is item number five, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two. 33, 34, 37A, and 38. That's, that's, that's correct. Is right. okay. your motion to approve those on consent? Approved. Second. Motion, second, approve those on consent. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Those items have now been officially approved. I believe, Bob, the items that we will be hearing today on public hearing are item 6, 14, 18. 22, 18? Not, not 18. No, it, it, no, it, that's right. It was on... It was 6, correct. 14, and 22. And 6, 14, and 22, 37, and 37. 30, and Item six is an amendment to the Manning at Bell Mead specific plan. The request is specifically to amend the plan to permit up to 36 multifamily units and reduce the height, um, the maximum height for the overall development. Staff is recommending approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. This is to only to amend a portion of the SP. Uh, the entire SP is outlined in red. The portion that's being amended is consist consists of two properties that are located on Woodmont. Uh, the zoning, again, is, is SP. The, the overall SP would permit 34 multifamily units and seven single-family homes, with six of the single-family homes being on Kenner and one single-family home being on the, the southern part, uh, which is parcel 138 on Woodmont. And again, the only area that we're looking at today is the area in gray. This is what's currently approved on the property. Um, again, we're talking about the part on Woodmont. It's 34 multifamily units in 10 stories. Uh, includes a 10-story building and a three-story building, which would be to the south. Um, so this is what they're proposing. So 36 units increase the density by two. Uh, on the north, you would have a seven-story building, which was a 10-story building, and then they've increased the height of the three-story building to four stories, and this also would take um, take the place of where there was a single-family lot, which was on the parcel 138, so you no longer have this a single-family lot that would have been to the, the south of the three-story building that was previously approved. Uh, access is from Woodmont Boulevard. There are three access points. The main access is from the central. Um, the two... Um, entrances or egresses on the extremes north and south are gated and those are for residents only uh, the public as well as residents could come in the central driveway the plan meets the collector uh, major collector street plan they're providing an eight foot sidewalk with a six foot planning strip all the other departments have approved the plan uh, the policy is this is the current policy is neighborhood evolving uh, which would uh, permit all types of residential uses, and this proposal is consistent with that policy. Uh, the gross preservation concept map with National Next, there's no change proposed. It will remain as neighborhood evolving, and again, it's consistent with that policy. In conclusion, staff is recommending approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions as the request is consistent with the policy. Thank you. This item is open for public hearing. The applicant will be allowed 10 minutes, and you can keep two back for rebuttal if you'd like. Good afternoon. My name is John Gore. I'm with Barge Cawthon Civil Engineers. I appreciate your time today. Um, as Jason said, this is an SP that was previously approved in 2005, and we're just back for a couple of uh, modifications and an amendment. 
uh, the first modification, as Jason said, is the original uh, The original plan was approved with two buildings. One was 10 stories and one was three stories. Uh, the, the new plan proposes a reduction in the maximum height so that the taller building would be seven stories and the adjacent building would be uh, four stories. Uh, we are asking for an addition of two units. The previous SP was approved at 34 units. We're, we're requesting uh, approval for 34 units. And this is also driven by there's a, a parcel on the south side uh, that's a single family parcel that's been added to the SP. And that's allowed us to increase our landscape buffer to 25 feet on the south side of the parcel to help uh, buffer the four story building from the single family residences to the south. Uh, the original SP was approved with uh, a number of council conditions, including uh, the preservation of all the single-family homes on the west uh, facing Kenner. That's still part of the SP. Uh, it also included extensive uh, roadway uh, improvements on Woodmont, including a, uh, a new center turn lane for the entire length of the project, which will be a big help uh, for people heading north towards Whitebridge Road. Uh, it also includes new bike lanes and new sidewalks on the uh, east side of uh, Woodmont, which are not there now. So. Uh, uh, we've worked with all the departments and um, worked through comments with staff, and uh, we appreciate your approval. Uh, but would be glad to answer any questions that you have. Okay. Thank you. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support of this measure? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Please come to the microphone, state your name, please, and your address. My name is George Brantley. Uh, I live at uh, 4104 Ashley Park, which is directly across the street from this project. Uh, we're right on Woodmont, but the little drive there is called Ashley Park. Uh, we have a concern uh, with the traffic. I'm sure all of you run into at the intersection of Harding and White Bridge and Woodmont. Uh, on the Woodmont side where we are, the uh, uh, the drawings for the property that in question indicate that the Manning's north entrance is directly aligned with our main entrance. Their main entrance is directly in line with the, the uh, Park Manor's entrance, which is the condominium uh, uh, units next door to us. And their south entrance is beyond that entrance toward Green Hills. Currently, the four lanes on Woodmont from the intersection of Woodmont and Harding only extend near the northern corner of uh, Manning of Bellmead's property. It's very difficult at high traffic times now for us to get out of our two entrances, the one entrance we have from our garage and also our main public entrance. The traffic from Manning is going to have even a greater problem exiting from their property at high traffic pro uh, times and creating a problem from up for us. The only way to offset this traffic problem is to extend the four lanes from the intersection of Harding and Woodmont past their southern corner. There have been several traffic accidents in this area. <clears throat> Without the extension of the four lanes, traffic accidents will increase. This extension will allow the traffic going to Harding to be divided between three or four lanes and not bunched up to one lane and it'll, it'll help greatly. And there's several other things that can be done, but the traffic infrastructure needs to be taken care of. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, applicants got two minutes for rebuttal. Is this, just a minute. Did you wish to speak in opposition? I don't know what you're talking about. I can't hear nothing back there. But I'm Evelyn Tomlin, and I own property on Hamilton Church Road, five this, acres. Yeah, this is not in that area, ma'am. This is in the Bellmead area. I know. I'm trying to find out what you're talking about. Okay. Is that, would the staff, one of the staff get with her and see if that item has been approved or if it's coming up so she'll be in the, yeah. be in the loop, so. Yeah. We don't have any information. Okay. We didn't Thank get you. We got, we got to get up with the little forms. Okay, the applicant now has two minutes for rebuttal. Sure. Appreciate it. I'll just uh, quickly address the traffic concerns. Uh, we appreciate the neighbor's concerns. 
Um, actually, there's been a TIS uh, done in 2005, and then it was a kind of re-review with Metro Publix during this um, during this process. And the tenor uh, turn lane is specifically what Metro Public Works has asked for. Um, if you've been in this section of road, there is a center turn lane as you head north to Wybridge Road, but it ends a couple hundred feet before this property. So uh, Public Works asks us that we extend it the length of the property, and this will help um, people that are going northbound to turn into the developments that the uh, neighbors were talking about, and it also help people heading southbound to turn left into this development. So I say we've addressed all of Public Works' concerns and are um, doing exactly what they've asked us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, declare the public hearing closed. Uh, Councilman Hunt, I'll start with you. I don't have any comments. Jessica? No comment. Hunter? Stuart? I'd like a little more um, explanation of what the, the, the neighbor was suggesting and how it differs from what, what the plan is. Uh, I'm just having trouble uh, visualizing it. So could we have contrast what, what the developer is plan, planning to do versus what that suggestion was? Sure, I'll be glad to. Jason, please pull up the site plan name. You have the... Um, this sort of shows a portion of it. I think the question is whether or not, if you look at the, uh, you'll see the center turn lane. Um, you see on the right, which is kind of the south side where it transitions back. Uh, as you head south, Woodmont Boulevard is just two lanes with no center turn lane. And once you get up to the intersection at, um, at Harding and Whitebridge Road, uh, uh, Woodmont is four lanes. The reason it can be four lanes the whole way is that there's a, um, a northbound right turn lane, if you can picture, that turns right to go on to a Harding, but it cannot extend north because there's also, if you're heading west on uh, Harding Road, there's kind of a fly fly through lane to head uh, north on Whitebridge Road, and there's poles and there's uh, kind of a little triangular center islands to protect uh, the westbound um, traffic that's turning north onto Bright Whitebridge Road, yeah. if you can picture that. So, uh, you know, we talked about this with Public Works, but they felt like the most efficient uh, improvement was just to uh, extend the center turn lane. And you can see from the drawings, it's not just along the frontage of this project. It's for several hundred feet um, to the north to tie in uh, to the existing center turn lane that's there. But I guess uh, the issue is that if you added two northbound turn lanes, there's nowhere for them to go. Um, once you get up to the intersection. It also gets into right away that once you leave their property, this property is dedicating a lot of right away, but once you head north on this property, there's a there's an office building and a gas station, some other areas where the, the right away is constrained. So most of these improvements um, are, you know, what the, this project can accomplish with their right away. All right, thank you. While you're, still, while you're, excuse me, so does it go just sort of line up with the southern edge of your property, the turning lane? Is that where it begins at the southern side? The southern edge is where it starts to transition and then it continues about uh, 150 feet beyond the to northern tie. edge to tie into where the existing uh, center turn lane starts now. Okay. Thanks. Andre? That was my question. Okay. Is there a motion? So I'll move. Motion to second to approve the staff recommendations. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Ready for item number 14. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Brett Thomas for planning. Item 14 is the Belmont at Blair specific plan located within Belmont Hillsboro. The existing zoning is R8 and is intended for single family dwellings and duplexes. The R8 zone district would permit four duplex lots for a total of eight units. The adjacent zone districts. Sorry about that. 
Applicant is requesting to rezone from R8 to specific plan in order to permit up to 15 attached residential units. The property is located at the southwest corner of Belmont and Blair Boulevards. The staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The existing zoning is intended for single family dwellings and duplexes. The R8 zone district would permit four duplex lots for a total of eight units. Uh, the adjacent zone di districts are R8 as well as RM20 to the north, the east, and further to the west on Blair. The property is currently occupied by three duplex buildings with a total of six residential units. The surrounding character includes single family residences with multifamily buildings interspersed. <coughs> Multi-family buildings are located to the north across Blair Boulevard, as well as to the east across, across Belmont Boulevard. A church is located to the northeast, and additional multi-family is located west down um, Blair Boulevard. The plan proposes 15 attached dwelling units on the site. Vehicular access is proposed to connect from Bl Blair Boulevard to the alley. Interior sidewalks connect the rear units with uh, Belmont, to the east and then Blair. Existing sidewalks and planter strips along Belmont and Blair Boulevards are to be improved and comply with the major and collector street plan. All garages are rear loaded and parking is prohibited in the street setback. Units one through 10 here in the front are proposed as three stories and 36 feet. The applicant is proposing units 11 and 12 in the rear as 36 feet and three stories in the front and then they would step back to two stories and 26 feet in the rear. Um, staff is conditioning approval of the request that units 11 and 12 not exceed 28 feet in height. This is consistent with units 13 and 14 also along the alley, which are a maximum of 28 feet in height. Unit 15, also against the alley, is proposed to be one and a half stories and 27 feet with the rear elevation along the alley at 24 feet. Uh, units 13 through 15 along the alley do not have garages. Current policy is T4 urban neighborhood maintenance. The SP zoning is consistent with the policy and proposes shallower setbacks at the intersection, building entrances oriented to the streets, parking in the rear, and lots have access to the alley. No changes are proposed with the growth and preservation concept map. The proposed development supports several critical planning goals, including a variety of transportation choices, walkable neighborhoods, range of housing choices, and infill development. Staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Thank you. This item is open for public hearing. The applicant be allowed 10 minutes to make a presentation. They can keep two back for rebuttal. Good afternoon, um, I'm Aaron White with Evergreen Real Estate, um, the development company proposing um, this particular project, also a neighbor at uh, 1401 Cedar Lane. Um, our company has gone through a process with this particular project. We uh, started by having um, initial meetings with the council lady, the um, neighborhood association board, and uh, Metro Historic staff. Uh, received feedback from those three groups and developed a site plan, a site plan and mask model working with uh, Albert Ward Architects, a local architect, and also Michael Ward, a neighbor in this uh, community. And then working closely with uh, uh, Jenkins, also Jenkins Harden, who will be speaking next. Um, through that process, we um, refined the plans. We There was a bit of uh, give and take with the neighbors, and at this point, um, we have support letters from uh, each of the adjacent neighbors, the Maddoxes to the uh, south of the property, the uh, Sewells to the north of the property, and then behind the property, uh, Mr. David Hagee and C.J. Hicks, whose properties line up um, across the alley. Um, we hosted a neighborhood meeting that was promoted through uh, the council lady and the neighborhood association. Um, we had about 30 people in attendance at that meeting and collected uh, feedback forms from it, um, generating a lot of local neighbor support. Um, I'd like to I'll provide a copy of these, and these have been provided to the planning staff. but. 
I'll just read a couple of the notes from neighbors. Uh, an email here that I'll submit um, from the council lady, Berkeley Allen, who couldn't be here today, but has expressed her support, just saying thanks for all the work you've done to make the neighbors more comfortable with this. I think everyone agrees it's a great project, and I'm glad we were able to adjust the massing on the back five in a way that works for you and for the neighbors. Um, some of these others, uh, Slinda Davis from 1305 Ashwood says, I like the look of the plans, um, but there must be something done about traffic control on Ashwood. Um, David Doris, 2706 Belmont says, great project by a great developer. Um, Cal Streetman, 1920 19th Avenue says, look forward to seeing it with the people involved. I'm sure it will turn out well. Um, I'll turn all these in. Uh, Philip Walker, who's actually a professional city planner, uh, lives at 2408 Belmont. Says great project. It will be a trans. It will transform an incredible development, an incompatible development, into a development that fits the context. Uh, Maggie Anthony from 920 Gale Lane says. I support the efforts Evergreen has done to include the neighborhood. My husband and I live on Gale Lane and are pleased with Gale Park and the open communication during the construction process for that project. Howard Ward Architect has done beautiful work and will be sensitive to existing homes. I support. So I will um, turn these in and um, not take the rest of your time. You'll be allowed two minutes for your rebuttal. Anyone in the audience wish to speak in support of this uh, project? Hi, my name is Jenkins Harden. I live at 2114 19th Avenue South, just a few blocks from the um, site. And I have been involved with Evergreen Real Estate and Mike Award and kind of the design and the um, reaching out to the neighbors. I'm a 17 year resident of the Belmont Hillsborough neighborhood. And I feel like that um, this development is really ideal for this corner. It's a, it's a, cor a high visible corner. It's an area that um, transitions from sort of the institutional and commercial part of the neighborhood to the residential part of the neighborhood. And I think the, um, the, the, shape of the lot makes it a really great site for this type of project versus duplexes. I think if um, the development ended up being eight duplexes, it would be really awkward and they would kind of be crammed on there in an odd way. Anyway, I think the design is very thoughtful um, and I think it provides a type of housing that's not really available in this neighborhood. Uh, um, and let's see. Oh, just, you know, have gotten lots of lots of wonderful feedback from the neighbors, and I think everybody's really excited about it. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Devinder Sandhu. I live at 1709 Ashwood. It is um, right across the street uh, from the property. Um, I have spoken to some of the neighbors who are immediately impacted by this uh, site. Uh, the Hicks family, which is across the alley, and Jeff Maddox, which is a resident to the south property boundary. And they have, I haven't been to the meetings, but I have gotten all the gossip from the neighbors. <laughs> and uh, I, I will say, as an engineer and also as a preservationist for that area, I'm glad to see the homes that are there now uh, go away and be replaced by something that's more street friendly and more compatible with the neighborhood. Um, there are There is a lot of massing, but I think for our neighborhood it works well, being in a, in a university setting and community. A similar development was done along Glen Echo near Belmont, uh, near uh, uh, David Lipscomb University at the corner of um, um, Belmont Boulevard and Glen Echo. Uh, and similar houses were built there, and they have seemed to have worked well along that area. So 
I had reservations initially about so many homes going in that corner, but I think uh, this will work really well for our, our community. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Please come to the microphone, state your name and address, please. I'm Bill Myers, and I'm a former president of Belmont Hills for Neighbors and one of the founding members. And uh, for many years, I've lived in the neighborhood for now 50 years in the same house, which you can see in the map of the plan there. And uh, I certainly support um, a nice uh, project going in there, but I oppose the rezoning from R8 to SPR. I think um, there is room for uh, a wonderful development without cramming so many units in. That's, that's my main concern. And if it would conform to R8, I have no problem with it. It will be part of the historic overlay. And um, I, I am very concerned and have been for 50 years about this, this is the bulwark end of the block and there have been many attempts to rezone it and I've fought them for 50 years and I'm going to do it again. Even though many of the speakers are good friends of mine and Berkeley Allen is a good friend of mine, I just prefer that it remain R8. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition? My name is Bonnie Myers, and I live at the same address, 2202 Oakland Avenue. And I've lived in the neighborhood for 45 years, 43 at that address. And I played a part in making Belmont Hillsborough neighborhood what it is today. I carried many petitions to clean it up. They say, be careful what you wish for. We wish to make it a nice place, and maybe we made it so nice that everybody wants to live there now. I just think the density is not in keeping with the character of our historic neighborhood. 15, min uh, 15 units means probably at least 30 cars. I'm also a landlord. I know that when you rent to two people, you get four cars, or, you know, or two cars. You rent to multiple people. Most families have two cars. I don't see how this protects and enhances the existing neighborhood. I think traffic's gonna be an increasing problem. I don't see how there can possibly be enough parking for the residents of this proposed building and their friends. We already do have parking on the street, so uh, that's already, you may say they're not supposed to, but they park there anyway. It's difficult to pull out of 18th Avenue. You can't see for the cars parked on the street. And we've also seen increase in stormwater problems with all the building that's gone on, particularly when it's on a hillside. That's not on a hillside, but you're covering up all the earth that's going to soak up the land. So I'm registering my position, as my husband said, we're friends with many of the parties involved and don't wish to get involved in neighborhood conflict, but I just don't think it's a great idea as is. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition? Hello, my name is Rebecca Godby. I live at 2203 Oakland Avenue, very near that site. I've lived in the neighborhood 30 years, and I've always liked the fact that I live in the historic overlay. Um, I would like for the overlay to remain, and I also want to second everything else that has been said in concern of this. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, applicant now has two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Um, we certainly respect uh, any any concerns, and we've uh, done our best to address those. With regard to some of the items just mentioned, um, you know the the zoning increase allows for a um, variety of home types in the neighborhood. 
um, under R8, 10 homes can be built. Um, if, the, if, the, if the lot sizes were approved under the amount of square footage, um, even though there's only four lots there. So with the existing lot configuration, eight homes, well, they would be eight very large homes. This allows some moderately priced homes to enter into the neighborhood. We wouldn't propose this um, mid-block. This is a corner lot. Uh, from this block north, um, there are no single family homes. It's only uh, institutional, commercial, restaurants. From this lot south, it's single family. So this is a transition uh, location and uh, I think an opportunity to provide a diversity of housing in the neighborhood as mentioned by the planning staff. Um, by contrast, the Albemarle, directly across the street and closer to the neighborhood is uh, is, is three stories, 20 units on about 0.2 acres. Um, all parking's on site. We're not using on-street parking. We exceed code required parking by 10 spaces. And uh, the massing um, and building placement has been submitted to the Historic Commission. It's been um, heard and approved at this time by Historic Commission. So we feel like it is in keeping with the character, both the current and the historic of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Declare the public hearing closed. Um, Stuart. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a, a really um, great neighborhood, and uh, yeah, it's and as its issues. Um, I think it's a first neighborhood association in Nashville and, and people organized to, to improve it and have done so. Um, it, um, it, some of the challenges, of course, are that they're, the, the two largest private um, colleges in the state are, are sort of next door to this area and the largest employer in the whole mid-state is you know, within a mile. And so, you know, you have a situation where people are very sensitive to traffic. Um, you have a situation where there are no left turns that can be taken from the neighborhood to the other main artery, Hillsborough Road. No left turn from Blair to the other side of, um, of um, 440 that has any signalization. <laughs> so you have people finding all sorts of ways to go through the neighborhood. And it turns out to be Blair and Beaumont that they have decided on. Uh, so I, I get why this is upsetting and, and, and had to be taken great care to, to get a certain level of, of support for it. I understand that that was probably not easy. Um, I do want, you know, and I read and there's some press about this, and they talked about the existing nondescript houses. And they are, um, you know, which I saw as a good thing. Um, maybe the kind of place I might have been able to move into after college. There aren't any places there now other than maybe those. But but I guess, I guess the thing is, um, it's almost a doubling. Uh, is it 10 or 8 that can be built now as a matter of right? 10 units or 8? It would be 8 units. There was an error in the staff report that stated 10. So it is almost a doubling of the individual units. As someone who lives about 3 blocks from there, I, I mean, we do know what happens without something like this, and it is it is within the strictures of the overlay, the conservation overlay, it will be McMansions um, with very low affordability. I think that's probably what would go there if this did not go through. And I think it is a an obvious core anchor to sit, say on Belmont, this is what we're going to do. We won't have more commercial. We, 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 it will stop here at this corner. So in some ways, it, it provides some stability in that way. I guess my main concern here is the historic nature. This is a conservation overlay. Is, is that right? It, it's part of the Belmont Hillsborough neighborhood that is part of that overlay. That is correct, and it would remain as an SP still on the overlay. So, it, which doesn't mean you have to keep the oldest thing there that's already there. It just means whatever you build there, if it has, if it meets historic zoning requirements, whatever you build back has to meet those. 
So are you saying that this has already been pre-approved more, more or less by Historic Zoning Commission? Historic has approved the massing. It would still have to, um, if the SP is approved by Planning Commission, project still returns to uh, MHCZ for approval of final details. So what, what it's replacing is, is not historic, is not no. probably. Correct. Nobody has claimed that that is historic, so they could take that out. Correct. I mean, with that, so that will go. But it is possible that this could be approved and modified in some way in, in terms of specifics by requirements of the Historic Zoning Commission until they satisfy themselves that it was it was in keeping with the overlay. Correct. They haven't, they've, they've sort of been, in a general way approved it, but not the specific plans. Correct. They're, um, they still would review materials, windows, doors, proportion and rhythm of openings, balconies, awnings, pertinences, and utility locations, and overall detailing of the proposal. So the, the form, the massing, is what's been approved. The, the major change then since it's been proposed is on the alley-related housing and that has gone down a story, is that what we're hearing? Correct, the units, staff's recommendation is that these four units are 28 feet, and then this one is one and a half stories at 27 feet, uh, which matches the existing residence here that's one and a half story. Okay, that's all Hunter. Thanks, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of things. One, just, and Stuart, you started to hit on it. I wanted to remind the Commission of a relatively recent change in policy of or procedure of how SPs within the uh, historic and conservation overlays are dealt with. In the past, we've had rezonings, SPs come through the, the Planning Commission, get approved perhaps even go through city council and get approved, and then they go to the Metro, Metro Historic Zoning Commission. And so there's been a number of projects that uh, I think the Historic Zoning Commission felt were out of scale with the neighborhood and didn't meet the guidelines and were sort of forced to figure out a way to uh, stretch the rules or, or you know approve a project that might not meet those guidelines. And so thus, just in the last six months or so, we've been sending all of these SPs that are, do lie within these overlays to the Historic Zoning Commission prior to bringing them here. And so uh, I don't believe I was at the Historic Zoning Commission meeting that when this um, was approved, um, but it gives me great uh, confidence that you know this is appropriate for this area. And, and I think from a planning perspective, um, this close to Belmont, um, the, you know, with the multifamily to the north of this, it's within walking distance of a neighborhood commercial center uh, at a key intersection there. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of the work of, of this developer, Mr. White, and his partners over the years as uh, some of the most appropriate infill that we've seen in Nashville, so I'm gonna support the project. Jessica. Um, you know, I certainly wanna recognize the, the concerns of the neighbors about about increased traffic um, and, and a change in, and obviously in the, the density of the area, but I, you know, I think that this project, as Hunter just said, does seem to fit, um, and I appreciate that it is a transition from the single family to the, the institutional and the um, commercial area, so, so I'm leaning towards supporting it as well. Walter. I'm trying to make sense out of, and I know he said it was in there, the parking. I see some parking where you got all the tools are at the below there. The garages. garages. Where are the garages on the other one? I see these on the bottom down where the two. Is this gray area? Where are the garages at? I just the, see them. The garages on these units, these boxes, white boxes that are behind each one. So those are the garages? Depicts where the garages are. Um, these two, the garages, 
are there as well. These two have garages here. These three units along the alley do not have garages because the yes, height has been stepped down. So they have surface parking, two spaces behind each unit. Okay. So where you got 11 and 12, those garages inside? 11 and 12 have garages that take access um, from this drive aisle here. How do they go in and out of it? Uh, this would be the garage door. I mean, how do they access the street, what I'm saying? How, is all this? They, I'm, this I'm not following the street, the ingress, egress out of it. There's an interior drive that accesses the alley in this location in the southeast, and then the interior drive comes through and also makes a connection to Blair Boulevard. Okay. Thank you. And that's a one line now. Yeah, further comments, Walter. Yeah, I, I just don't understand that. I, I, I'm gonna have to vote against that until I can understand the ingress, egress, in and out of that. I just don't see. I don't see the accessibility to get out. Maybe I'm missing something. I, I just don't. Well, each unit has a garage except the three that's on the alley, and those, those are surface parking. So each unit has two two parking spaces. Mm -hmm. So this is an aerial of the site. The interior drive would access Blair Boulevard okay. in this location, come down through the site, and then connect to this alley in this location. Now that's the box where you just left, you know, the down below there, right there. Down here. How, how did they get out of there? There's a curb cut in the or There's a cut in the alley where the interior drive comes in. And so all the... So this is, this is the alley here. This would be the interior drive connecting here. That's the one I was talking about. That's one that make a whole lot of sense to me. But okay. Other comments, or is that it? Okay. Andre? Um, I think this is gonna be an exciting project. Um, I was concerned at first about the, the back units and happy to hear that they've been changed in size and also that the neighbors adjacent across the alley from them are happy with them. Um, I do know that there's some other units sort of like this along Ashwood, I think, already that have maybe a, a ancillary housing in the backyard that fronts on the alley. So this isn't the first in that area anyway, is that right? Okay. And I think the, the only, the neighbors that I've talked to just over time, when those happen, um, the only frustration the neighbors had that I heard of was just the quality of construction. And we don't have any control over that. So I think we're all looking forward to this one being a quality, uh, well-built uh, building. Um, and I think, do you, did you see that the, the cars come off the alley straight to the parking spaces? They come from the alley to the parking spaces. I don't know if you noticed that too. So they, everybody has access to the alley on that back side. Um, I, I just think it's, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Derek? Uh, actually, I support this, uh, this uh, development and I move approval. Uh, of, with conditions uh, for uh, I move approval for with uh, staff's recommendations. Is there a second? Go ahead. We got a question. Just a second. Go ahead. We comment. And I apologize if um, the applicant addressed this, but I did want to uh, ask the applicant if um, did you address the additional conditions that the staff has has put, requested, and are are you all? Okay with those. We are. Okay. Thank you. Got a motion, second, oh, Stuart. Yeah. I um, I actually believe um, believe that this is supportable, but only barely, just because of the the uh, some peculiarities of the area. But it, I'm, I also support the general idea of of using alleys more than we have been. I get that, but uh, I'm hoping we're making a commitment as a city to make those alleys a little bit more than they have been in terms of uh, safety, in terms of 
aesthetics. I don't know that we're going to make them two-way. It means some people will have to go down and around and things like that, or else back up. Like behind my house, <laughs> you can't get. It's certainly a one 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 lane alley. But I'm I'm just that doesn't go to my vote. I'm just saying I, I hope we. I hope Public Works uh, and other city agencies are working to make those alleys workable as we do more, use, uh, use the alleys more. Rick, do you think we are moving that direction? I think, I think we are slowly. I think that, uh, uh, that there's some recognition of the need for lighting. There's some recognition of the need for paving the alleys, and we're seeing that in some areas. It's probably not enough, not as much as we need to, but I would agree these, are one, these should stay one-lane alleys or else they wind up being a lot worse if you wind up with has to be two two lane alleys. I mean, and all of us. I mean, I live on one, one lane, one one way, one lane alley, and you obviously figure out how to get through there with backing up and all that. So, yeah. oh, so we don't have any. Is it currently paved? This alley? Yeah. Okay, so it would remain paved, and this depending on how well we do with public works in the future. Well, and okay. Stuart, a lot of the neighbors in that area do work on improving their portion or their alleys, and it, so they might be a good candidate for the new green alley um, project that's happening in the nations, as an example. So that might be might suggest that this area consider that as the next area to take on that type of project, because the neighbors could work together with that sort of project to help it. Yeah, yeah, just one thing. I think I think Public Works' responsibility is, is to try and maintain the alley and, and the lights. I think it's our responsibility as people that live on the alleys to maintain the portions that are up there. That's, that's, that's the biggest complaint I have is not Public Works. I think they're doing their job. It's, it's people that live on my alley that doesn't, don't maintain their, their, their property. Yeah, right. <laughs> You have another comment? I hope on? they're not. Yeah, I hope they're not watching. <laughs> Do they know who they are? I don't know. I had to cut the grass. So. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add that this particular alley does have four outlets. Uh, it's a cross alley, so there's four ways in and out of it, and plus the additional drive that the developers providing provides a fifth way in and out. And I think the majority of these residents will be using the primary entrance going out to Blair, anyways. Well, and that would be my one last broken record of just suggesting that the developer consider pervious pavement wherever possible. Is the motion is second on the on the table. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. One. Walter, one 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 opposed. Councilman Hunt. Sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, item 22. We're ready. Good afternoon. Item number 22 is a zoning application for 844 and 846 Cherokee Avenue. The request is to rezone from IWD to RM20A. The properties are highlighted in red. They are located in East Nashville, just west of Ellington Parkway. Staff's recommendation is to disapprove. Current zoning is IWD. The surrounding zoning is also IWD and RS5. Current policy is T4 neighborhood maintenance. The proposed um, zoning change to RM20A is not consistent with the T4 urban neighborhood maintenance policy. The proposed growth and preservation concept map indicates this area changing to T4 mixed use neighborhood. While the proposed growth and preservation map policy could support multifamily units in this area, staff finds that the request is premature until additional properties along the street are included in a rezone request. The item on the screen right now shows existing land uses. This is, um, as you can see along the street, um, they have a mixture of residential, commercial, and industrial uses. 
the next slide is just an example of looking at this street in a broader context. Um, the properties that are in green are not industrial or commercial use properties. They would be the residential or vacant properties um, from what we have from the tax assessor. Zone changes in this area require a comprehensive look at the area in a broader context to ensure appropriate transition to a mixed-use neighborhood. Because this rezone does not include additional properties for a comprehensive look at the area, staff does recommend disapproval. So items open for public hearing. That could be allowed uh, 10 minutes and keep two back for rebuttal. If council would like to speak first, would you like to speak first? Well, give him back his few seconds on the clock. <laughs> Thank you, commissioners, planning staff. Thank you for all your hard work and countless hours. Thank you for all your volunteer hours, commissioners, because I, I know you'd rather be home or watching the game. However, though, you're here to serve our city. I thank you for that. The applicant, in full disclosure, is a current resident and constituent of mine. So if I'm a little overzealous, um, please forgive me for that. You know, I know we don't promise the pursuit, you know, it's the pursuit of happiness. We don't guarantee anyone's happiness. And trust me, I'm going somewhere. I know I'm out of the ballpark a little bit, but I want to get back in really quickly. Okay. Um, day after day, my average citizens see us on the television, see the zoning signs pop up, get yellow cards in the mail, and also they get letters saying, hey, I want to buy your house. Hey, I want to buy your house. I'll give you this much for it. Give you that much for it. Hey, I can give you more money if I can rezone it to put five houses there. All the time. And I always tell my citizens, why can't you do this? Why can't you make your neighborhood better? I suggest you go and find a piece of land somewhere where it might be industrial or underutilized or somewhere where your neighbors won't fuss too much at you. And I say that I'm only human, because just like all of you on here, I get fussed at too a lot for different decisions. And so when I tell my citizens that, and they go and pursue their happiness, it is my job to have their back as their councilman. Well, I have my constituents back on this one. Okay, I understand the planning commission's, I'm sorry, excuse me, the planning staff's reasoning. I wish I could rezone more property here to RM20. Um, there's a parcel on the front of Cherokee that I rezoned around two years ago to RM20. And I did that for a developer. Now, saying I cannot do that for my citizen, my constituent, my neighbor, I have to stand with my neighbor on this one. And I encourage you to stand with my neighbor also. And if you feel like you don't, you can't stand with my neighbor, I understand it's nothing personal. You're all still wonderful people, okay? However, though, I want you to put yourself in their shoes. You all are all successful individuals on this commission, and you're very knowledgeable. But right now, we have a crisis of affordability. And this is a heavily industrial area which it's a lighter industrial use to what we're used to in the IG, and if I'm wrong, um, Brother Sloan, please correct me. Um, one thing I do want to talk about here is allowing him to build some ho homes on this property. Um, my neighbors on Chickasaw, on Edwin, around there, they're in support. They don't want another industrial use on this property. Um, some of the industrial businesses that have been there in the past, some they liked, some they disagreed with. However, though, they want to see some growth and development in right areas. You know, Scott, quit throwing all this stuff in this area. This is where we want to go. Yes, you should do something there. This will help us around here. And I went to talk to some neighbors, and the applicant has also talked to other neighbor property owners. Some property owners are in support of this on that strip, but they don't want their property rezoned. And I still feel like it's America, so I don't want to rezone their property against their wishes. And there's some that may come around. However, though, there are property owners who don't want this to be rezoned, just full clarification. They like the industrial zoning. Well, their property can stay industrial zoning if they want to, because I'm not going to force them to change it. I may not upzone it, but at the same time, I'm not going to downzone to IWD without the owner's permission. This is the owner, this is my constituent. 
he wants to down zone from IWD where it could have a heavier use that my neighbors on the adjacent streets won't like to, you know, a, a use where we can get some good looking, more affordable multifamily housing. Because we all know about the prices in Cleveland Park, McFerrin, Maxwell, they're going through the roof. This is an uncharted area where we can get some affordability there and get some great looking houses. We got the land mass, the building costs may not be as much because the land's gonna be cheaper. And a lot of you are business people with, who are a lot smarter than I am, but you can understand this. And I have to fight for my citizen. So please forgive me. I may run the football on this one, hmm. okay? And it's not a threat. I'm not even fully decided yet. But if I can't stand with my people and my constituent, how, what good am I if I do this for developers? So I'm asking you and I'm imploring you, help my constituent because I have no choice. I got to help this, this man behind me because I'm just a big old hypocrite if I don't. Thank you. And thank, I, you. thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Applicant now be allowed 10 minutes and you keep two back for rebuttal. Councilman Davis, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, I'm here today as the as a landowner and uh, what I'm trying to do is go from IWD to RM20. Um, talking with my next door neighbors on each side uh, that's adjacent to my property, I invited them to add their properties on with me, which was a recommendation by staff. Uh, neither of them wanted to add on, but neither of them were opposed to what I'm trying to do. Um, Mrs. Jones, to the, to the uh, north side of me, uh, sweet older lady, she just wants to live out her days and, and she's fine with that. And Laura Bond, to the south of me, um, she's just not interested in doing anything with the property anytime soon. Uh, with the other property owners, I haven't heard any complaints, any disagreements. Um, the current housing stock that's on the property, uh, the, the house on the, on the south side, 846, that house is falling in. It's been falling in for roughly about 20 years. Uh, I bought both properties off of Bob Hoover, who the Codes Commission is very, very well versed with. Um, he has a, new, a number of blighted properties within the city. I'm trying to take something that's been blighted for 20 or 30 years and turn it into something that's going to be affordable housing, something that firefighters and police officers that can afford to, to live in something nice, a new construction, whereas everywhere else around, there's a lot of house, housing stock that I can't afford to live in. I, I live over on North 2nd Street, and I see properties every single day being torn down and $350,000, $400,000 houses popping up. I can't afford that. This is something where you can have 150, 200,000 dollar houses, and the firefighters or the, the police officers that live a quarter mile as, a, as the crow flies on Trinity, they could afford to live there. It's a nice area, it's a quiet street, it's a dead end on a cul-de-sac, there's not much traffic there. Um, going on to Jones Avenue, not much traffic there either. Um, in my opinion, this is, this is something that's very, very doable, and I'd really appreciate it if I had your support on this. Thank you. I reserve my time. You'll be allowed two minutes for rebuttal. Anyone wishing to speak in support, please come to the microphone. Um, my name is Betty Chapman, and I have property on Cherokee Avenue. And um, I think you'll find it more residential on this side of Cherokee on the opposite side of Ellington Parkway, which Cherokee runs on the opposite side of Ellington. And I'm in favor of it being residential because of all the debris and things people bring in there from off of the other job sites. I mean, we don't like to look at it. And it's, it's really, it's not being took care of, the properties. So that, you know, I would like for it to remain resident, for it to be rezoned residential. And so I thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in support? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Justin Luther. Uh, I'm actually representing Jarrett Builders today. Uh, we own three lots on Cherokee Avenue, uh, 83335 and 37. And uh, we actually would like to keep it uh, industrial um, zoning. Um, when this was previously um, 
in RM20 zone, uh, the crime rate was significantly higher. Um, and it's actually decreased now because we've switched it over to an industrial warehousing, which was actually the initial intent of this rezone. Uh, it's greatly improved the area and the economy. So, I mean, in short, rezoning these back to a multi-structure family home would be a step in the wrong direction. Um, and I actually have um, a petition that I went to a few business owners on Cherokee Avenue, and they signed and agreed saying, you know, we want to keep it industrial. So. Uh, I appreciate you guys um, hearing me on this matter, and uh, thank you. I'm trying to take people that are in support of this. Anybody else in the audience in support? Anyone in opposition? Seeing none, then you've got two minutes for rebuttal. Uh, just in response to that, as far as crime rate, um, it's, uh, to my knowledge, the police station on Trinity is only a couple years old. Um, since that's been built, uh, crime in the whole area has gone down precipitously. So as far as the crime rate is concerned, I think that's kind of a non-issue at this point in time. But there's also a lot of neighbors in the area that are very vigilant uh, in making sure that crime is not around. I know uh, Larry King, who lives catty corner to me, um, He's had cameras out before, way back in the day, making sure people weren't dropping trash off at the end of the road. Um, he's been there for 10, 15 years. Great citizen. Um, I don't think that I don't think that we're going to have an issue um, with with crime. As far as uh, the businesses are concerned, I think that, from my perspective, business owners are probably more concerned about their own interests as far as say a construction company and people complaining about dirt being tracked onto the onto the road where they should be keeping the road clean in the first place basically what you have is you have citizens keeping keep an eye on on industrial properties and business owners making sure that they're held accountable to to standards that they should be kept kept to um, so as far as i can see you know that, that kind of development towards the end of the street, it's going to have very minimal impact, but at the same time, it's going to be a positive impact. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Clear the public hearing closed. Uh, Andre? Um, I had a question about the zoning, um, <clears throat> the timing of it. How were there, is there new recent IWD or IR over on around Cherokee, or has that been there for a really long time? I that's been there for a while. That's okay. Yeah. For years? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess I was just checking sort of to see about what we thought about the policy versus 16 units, um, how that would fit. It looks like it's a lot of single family houses. Um, could you address that again, please? I'm sorry. Just sure, help. sure. The, the policy intended to go to the T4 mixed-use neighborhood. It, multifamily may be permitted, but really we want to take a look at the entire street in a full, um, broader area context because there are single-family residential there mixed in with commercial and other industrial properties. Okay, but if it were the newer policy, it could be moderate to high density residential. Oh, correct. Yes, and it, it, it may support then. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Very. Could you bring up that slide that you just had up? I wanted to look at Sorry, it once again it. because I'll be honest with you, I'm having a little trouble getting my mind around uh, what I'm seeing there on the picture and what I'm seeing up here because it looks like we have a, a number of residential units in this industrial zone area and this change is where's the inconsistency I guess that's my question I think just to clarify I mean the, the change to residential is not the problem it's just that what we recommended was it was premature they need to change all this to residential I mean or, or at least this half of the block all needs to be changed to residential what we were concerned about was you're going to get residential in here and then you're going to get industrial and actually the council comments make that even worse because you've got people that actually want to keep the industrial presumably to use it as industrial so what you're going to wind up with we wouldn't support the res we would support the residential it just needs to be more than these two lots thank you and, and what would prevent it or prevent us from going larger with residential uh, at this 
at this stage because I, I'm not necessarily against this project, but what's the but why just these two lots and not a larger area? And I don't. Yes. Um, like I said uh, prior, with Mrs. Jackson, who is at 842 Cherokee, and Laura Bond, who's at 848 Cherokee, I tried to include them on, <clears throat> which with the, with those two properties, well, those two parcels would have given us a total of two square acres. Um, so I'm, I'm still trying to do that. Um, I just told them that as far as time is kind of of the essence for me. So... Um, I wanted to include them in on it. They're always more than welcome to add on. They just don't want to do anything one way or the other right now. Um, but I also want to point out further on down the road, there are two parcels that are almost identical in size to me, already zoned RM20A, that were rezoned about two years ago prior. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart? We have a, a responsibility, I think, to um, to make planning decisions and not and not um, uh, political decisions. Um, and I don't think we very often have simply carved out a couple of lots. Um, and I think all the problems that we assume would be there with these competing uses. Uh, will be there if we do this. Um, I just, I agree with staff. As a planning matter, uh, we we need to uphold that and, and not essentially have what looks to me like a uh, spot zone. Hunter? Um. I agree with Stuart that we need to be, you know, making smart planning decisions. I think I think this is a little bit fuzzy what's smart because we've got a policy, existing policy that, as far as I understand, allows up to 20 units to the acre, which RM20A is. I know we don't always take it to the extreme, but the existing policy calls for that. Doesn't call for industrial, uh, and the proposed policy calls for um, more, more of a mixed use, you know, neighborhood, again, not industrial. Uh, so this uh, would be moving the, the zoning in the right direction toward either one of those policies, really. Um, and, you know, if we go back to the land use map, all that yellow is residential. It appears there's only four industrial uses on the street and two commercial uses on the street. The remainder's vacant lots and residential, especially at this end. So, you know, while I um, understand that it's, I understand the staff's uh, approach, but as Rick said, it's not the residential that they have a problem with, you know. Uh, and. You know, the last project we just looked at was at 16 units to the acre. So this would allow something not much more than those nice townhomes that we just approved. So, you know, given the policy that's existing, given the policy that's recommended, um, I think the, the industrial uses really are the sort of the, uh, the oddballs here. <laughs> Uh, though I know the property is zoned that way, but given the policy, I think I think I can support uh, a transition, and, and I can understand that no property owner can come and rezone an entire street. It happens over time, and and uh, or maybe they maybe they can technically, but well, the council member obviously can propose that, and that was that was where we were going with this. We thought everything at least west of that last industrial property ought to ought to be rezoned to residential, and. There hasn't been the willingness to to do that, and and it, it's not possible to add, once you once you have a bill there, it's not possible to add any property to that. You clearly could take it out, but you can't add it add to property. Everything west of the or east of it, east of that last industrial, at least, yeah. Right, right, yeah. That's why we thought it made sense to rezone it all to 
the residential. I, I don't. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that would make sense too, but I think there's a political process that you know um, that 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 could occur within. So, you know, I'm interested in hearing the other commissioners, but based on the existing policy, based on the proposed policy under Nashville Next, based on the existing land uses that are there, um, I think I'll be supporting. It. Jessica. So I appreciate Hunter's uh, logical explanation there. That, that helped me. Um, and also certainly appreciate the desire to, to um, find available land that we, can, that we can think about building affordable housing on. That's exactly what we've been talking about, is how can we get land that's currently affordable to put back into production with some affordable units on it. Um, I, I'm curious to see kind of the idea, the concept for that area. Um, I guess as, as Commissioner LaQuire pointed out, there's a lot of single family homes there. So I do think 16 units or 15 units right there may be tricky with the neighborhood context. Um, but you know, that's, I guess that's the next stage <laughs> that we would, that we'll discuss. Um, so yeah, I mean, this map makes it really challenging when I look at it, just seeing how many different uses there are. But given how much of that land is vacant um, and could ultimately be pulled into a rezoning, um, I think I'm leaning towards supporting it as well. Walter. Well, I can <clears throat> certainly say it's a really tricky piece of property uh, with all the different mixed uses in it. And at some point in time, a decision has to be made uh, whether or not it's going to go industrial or residential or use the vacant lots for affordable homes or whatever. I know that that's a good uh, position to take with the vacant lots, uh, building affordable homes on it. So to me, it's hard for me to make a decision on this piece of property because it's just so much. And I guess I need to support the staff <clears throat> recommendation. I don't know. So I'm just going to wait and see what happens. I have, a, I have a question um, about the timing and and wondering if 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 if, it, if there were time to kind of make a plan for that stretch. I mean, the the potential, the proposed policy even allows light industrial. So it would kind of allow all of these things to be as they are, um, with any number of uses: residential, industrial, commercial, in between, and. If there were, I just, I guess I feel like if there were timing for planning to to work up that whole area and decide which way, you know, what it's going to be or where it's going to go, um, that might help everybody be more comfortable in every, all sides of the, art of the discussion. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, it's, I'm really torn. <laughs> I agree with Andre. Uh, I, I would like to see uh, something back to us on this because, let's be honest here, one of the things that we're dealing with here in Nashville is affordable housing. And if this is an area where we can provide affordable housing and it looks like this area is, is trending towards more residential where more affordable housing can go, I think we would be derelict in our duties if we did not encourage uh, staff to, to look at this and, and to propose something to us because uh, let's be, again, we've got to do something about for affordable housing in, in Nashville. And, uh, and like I said earlier, I'm not necessarily against this project. I think it's moving in the right direction. And again, once we look at what's in yellow, it's in keeping with what we're seeing uh, on, on this map here. So I, I'd like to see something done about this from a planning perspective, staff recommend something to us, or what, I guess the other thing is what solutions are out there, what can staff do to bring this back to us so we can address this particular issue, uh, or is it just a matter of just voting it up or voting it down and being done with it, or is it a political issue? Well, you know, 
I like to, <clears throat> the idea that you and Andre said, it's <clears throat> something needs to be done with it. Um, you know, and it is a lot of residential pieces in there. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, you know, I, I don't know. It, <clears throat> it's going to go one way or the other eventually anyway. It's just a matter of time, and I like the idea maybe the staff give it a little bit more work and look at it a little bit more and come up with something that they can recommend um, where it can coexist, maybe. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's another avenue we can look at that I don't know about yet. I have another thought is that we talked about comparing it, Hunter, to the Hunter. We compared it to the site we just looked at. That site had an alley. And so would 16 units on this size parcel with no alley be something we would normally consider and think is reasonable and compatible and workable with that in that kind of street? It's a dead end street. And as I can tell, I don't think there's any alley, right? No, no. So if you go back to thinking of, even if you wanted to make it more affordable units and multiple housing, <coughs> I'm suddenly thinking, well, would 16 with no alley on a dead end work very well? And so is that maybe another reason the staff would be saying this is, we're not quite ready for this in that location? So, I don't know. I'm just, I'm kind of suddenly thinking about the practicality of it. And then as, again, as a precedent, if we're going to say 16 units on those two little parcels with no um, alley, then what is that? lean the rest of the street as it is mostly single family and it, it is a dead end with some deep lots so I just I kind of want to caution us on that thought for a second can I make a motion that this go back to staff and let them take another look at it to see what can be done to actually develop this piece of property one way or the other, you know, make it have some, put some consistency in it. You know, right now it's like a rainbow. And I think that it could be brought together where it could be more consistent for good use. We could should. bring a recommendation back as to what the commission could initiate the rezoning. And then, the, I mean, it would take a commission, a commission initiated rezoning, but that could be done. Yeah. Can we look at that? Can we make a motion to do that? Well, I mean, are we... Are we prepared or ready to be able to do that is for the staff? I mean, I mentioned it, but I'm just thinking, what about our timing here with the National Next coming up? And I mean, what you're going to what you're going to try and do is make a maker some sort of a maker district in here that, that allows a mixture of uses that provides some consolidated access. We can't do a design plan. No, we could bring some straight zoning, but it's going to be straight zoning. I think anything would probably be better. I mean, you know, we could probably do today say you know rezone the whole thing to RM20. That's the, a lot better than than rezoning two lots. No, I like the idea of a mixed area, and, and that that's what the policy is proposed to be. So I think not well, that can't be done. That, would, that can't be done. For the whole block, would be. Well, I'm just saying it can't be done for the next meeting. No. Well, then I would I would I don't want to ruin this guy's dream either, but I do think that 16 units on a lot with no alley and a dead end is my first flag. <laughs> If it could be sure. reconfigured and come back to us, maybe, or deferred, or, I don't know, well, even Chairman, without the whole block being I'm considered. Sorry. Stuart. Sorry, Stuart. No, that's fine. I just, to me, what I was trying to say was, uh, I, was what we in our role can do. And, and we can't, I don't think, go into the business of picking out two lots like this. I don't have any problem with the councilman trying to do that. Uh, or, or if it passes the council, I won't be particularly worried about it. I just think there's something to be said for our role in sticking with that and making a systemic decision of some sort. Uh, I know why I don't want to do the whole thing because there's not consensus and you don't really want to go rezoning against the owners. Right. I haven't done that very often. Um, so I get the problem here. I'm just saying our role is a little bit different than than 
mm. that a broad desire to, to see it change, and so you're hoping to move it along with a couple of lots. So that, that's why I was going to support staff recommendation, not that it's it can't be argued the other way from a from a uh, council point of view, but I just don't think we, we can do that right now. Uh, and nor do I know whether there's enough time uh, to, to come back later. He, uh, the council member may want to go ahead and have this heard now, one way or the other. Sir. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, we need to be making smart planning decisions. And I, again, I look at both of these policies, and I think this zoning change is bringing the property closer to um, both policies than the, than the existing zoning does. So we have a plan. We have a community plan that calls for neighborhood maintenance. As far as I understand, someone tried to rezone a property to industrial in a neighborhood maintenance area. That would not be recommended by staff. We have a T4 mixed-use neighborhood uh, um, proposed policy in Nashville next, which might allow some industri light industrial maker uses. Are they sa sa similar or same uh, as what IWD would allow? So the proposed um, policy has a mixture of uses. It could be residential, non-residential uses. It's, it, it does provide that mixture. So you very well could um, propose something like that in this policy. So, you know, with that, um, you know, it's very consistent with the Nashville Next proposed policy. And I think I heard the staff say that that, that policy would allow a little more density than the existing policy or, or might, might allow. That's a moderate, moderate, to high that density residential. moderate to high versus, well, yeah, okay. So I, I, agree, I think Stuart and I agree. I think we're just coming to a different conclusion perhaps, but um, um, because I, you know, I see this proposal as con I understand the staff's position that uh, as a single standalone, you know, zoning change, it uh, it could be better. <laughs> it could be more of this street. It could be um, the whole street. There could be some consistency here, but but uh, since it's moving toward what I feel moving toward uh, being consistent with both of these policies, again, I think that's the, the right planning decision based on our plan. And the reality is it's residential getting redeveloped is residential. Is it's currently it's residential. It's currently residential. And uh, I guess a question about the level of, or the use on the dead end without the alley, I mean, I don't think the amount of traffic that an RM20 um, project would generate would, and especially with a relatively short street uh, here, that it would create major traffic problems with, you know, obviously it'd be better to have an alley, questions arise about <coughs> dealing with trash and dumpsters and so on. And, um, I wish it, I wish this was an SP because then we could look at those kind of things and make sure the dumpsters aren't out on the sidewalk and um, maybe there's other regulations that would prohibit that I don't know but um, but that's not what they're requesting so well, at this time at this time of in between when we don't quite have national next yet would would an SP be more practical so that because it isn't well instead of a straight zoning because we could have some of those controls well Without I go back to the whole reason why we went through creating these a districts because there are some design criteria within those a districts and the whole point was that you know we were getting to where every rezoning was an SP and you know people like SPs but it was uh, you know but there was a lot of you know Concerned that you know why why do anything else you know if, if you can't you know we need some zoning districts that don't require you know someone especially looking to do an affordable product to go spend a lot you know at risk on the front end spend a lot of money to design a plan that may or may not get approved that's why we created those A districts and there are some design guidelines related to those I don't know if particularly the one I mentioned, the dump, if a dumpster could be on the street with, within this district, I don't know. It could not. 
There are some design guidelines within the A district, certainly, that control um, the height and where it is at the setback and a step back from that. But there's other regulations within the zoning code of where you can and cannot put um, dumpsters and et cetera. So okay. maybe not specifically in the A district, but it is within the zoning code. Okay, thank you. Anyone would like to make a motion? We restate your, we didn't get a second on restate your motion. I was, I would make a motion to, and I know it's going to probably be difficult, but I was counting the different uses on this piece of land, and I was just wondering if we could refer it back to staff to let them take a look, another look at it to see what is the best uses for this piece of property, be it residential, be it industrial, or the vacant lot where we can use for affordable housing. Some kind of way these pieces got to go together and maybe rezone it where it'd be more sensible, cut it down to maybe two uses instead of eight uses, and see if you could come up with some kind of sensible method of using this particular strip of land. That would be my motion. <clears throat> Is there a second? I think Rick just Rick kind of reiterated what I was talking about. Don't say a second. There's another motion. I have a question before motion. What's the status of the bill in terms of the council and our timing and how much time we have to think about this? There's no bill requested at this time for this application. Was that a motion to defer? I guess I'm not really sure I understand. It failed. Oh, okay. oh, actually. So actually we do have a little bit of time. I mean, the councilman yeah. can file the bill, mm -hmm. but we, we're not under a timeline that it will be deemed approved if we don't vote on it today. I don't know what we do with that, but it's like we're having a problem in deciding. <laughs> yeah, for a lot of good reasons, we're having the problem. I don't know. I, think I, I would be more comfortable if I had a site plan or something to have a sense of what, how, how is this such a long, deep site? I mean, I, all I can picture right now is one building with parking on the side of it, and, and I'm not sure how that's compatible in the neighborhood. Hunter? Um, I guess the councilman's comment, I guess I worry a little bit about take, sending it back to the staff. I'm not sure what the question is, because the staff has stated that they don't really have a problem with the use that's being requested. Um, there's nothing that, that, I mean, I suppose we could try to rezone the whole street, but, you know, I, su I suspect, you know, that's not, uh, you know, that that's not just, not realistic. Uh, and so, again, you know, this being the current use is residential, staff doesn't have a problem with the use, it's coming, you know, uh, moving the direction toward the both existing policy and the proposed policy. Um, you know, I, I think, and, and given that the staff's recommended of dis recommendation of disapproval is um, because of the existing zoning that's around it, um, you know, and, and not because they feel like this is an inappropriate use for the site, is what I think I heard. Um, for all those reasons, um, I'll make a motion uh, that we uh, approve the project or the, re the re rezoning request. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. And we got a motion a second to approve the project with the staff record with the recommendations at the staff. Uh, let me read you those. You don't have any. Just uh, so. You want me to put in there if we get approved? Yeah. It. But this is a straight rezoning. Okay. Yeah. So, are we allowed to ask the applicant anything about the use of it? I mean, I feel like I know this is you a straight know, you rezoning. You certainly can. Yeah. 
just be aware that there's nothing, as long as it's in the zoning, I it's know. nothing that requires it. I know. Yeah. But I'm curious, because <laughs> is that okay? Is that allowed? Sure. Can you tell us a little bit more about the project that you're planning? Well, basically, this has just been my first step. Okay. I'm looking forward to partnering with a, a developer on that. Um, so it will be a partnership, but I'm not intending on, you know, building any slums or, or anything like that. It'll be something that's, that's nice and affordable. How, how many square feet um, and what, what would be your sales price? Um, my ballpark price would be somewhere between 150 to 200,000. Um, you know, about 1,100 square foot, per se. So, some, somewhere in that ballpark. What's the width of the lot? Is it two of the um, is it two? So, the, the dimensions are basically, with the two lots combined, it's 100 by about 335. Okay. okay got a motion, second. Other dis any other discussion? Okay, got a motion, second, to approve the project. All in favor, I need to see a uh, raise your hand. Okay, you've got four positive, um, opposed, two opposed, so the motion carries. Project is approved. So, Hunter, do you have anything from um, historic? Uh, no. Yeah, but it's next, it's not the point order. Rick, right. The next item, and I'm going to go through this because if if there are questions, this is your process and procedures is for the um, oh, I'm sorry. holding of the hearing. I forgot we'd taken that one off. I wasn't jumping out. Oh, well, I think it's next anyway. Yeah. Um, Seven B. And the executive committee met and recommended basically this procedure, but I want to go through it. If there's any concerns, we need to talk about it now as opposed to having concerns come up at the meeting uh, because you're going to adopt this. Um, the meeting was June 15th. It would start at 3 o'clock, planning commission meeting, and that was changed from 4 o'clock in order to allow council members that would be at the finance and budget committee meeting to attend and make their statement if they wanted to do that between 3 and 4. So um, basically, the members of the public, and we're going to have a set up out in the hall where we're going to have them filling out a request to speak form. They're going to define what they want, what they call their item. We're not going to be interpreting it for them. They're also going to be putting details out. And, and I've included, I think, in your handout the request to speak form. But at 3 o'clock, the meeting would be called to order by the chair. Immediately following that, then the council members would be allowed to speak uh, there. Um, that will be followed by a staff presentation, which will be relatively short. We need to make sure that we have everything necessary entered into the record uh, so that it's, it's part of the record. So we'll, we'll do that. And then the chairman would open up the public hearing. Now, e each person may address the commission once, and all comments are limited to a maximum of two minutes. Um, we intend to try and organize this and take, try to get people, and we don't know whether there's going to be two people or there's going to be a hundred people. We simply don't know that. We're anticipating the opportunity where people could come in and um, basically um, sign up, if you will, or, or in, a, in an order that would give them a time block, a 30-minute time block. You're going to speak between 4 and 4.30 or 4.30 and 5 or 7.30 and 8, and they can choose to leave or come back or whatever if they, if they want to leave, so they don't necessarily have to stay here. Um, that would allow them to leave. We wouldn't call them for that time block until they wouldn't be expected to show up early if, if uh, they're, so we're going to have to monitor that. Um, the people would hand their request to speak form uh, to the staff. They would make their they would make their presentation to the commission. All comments are going to be presented to the commission. I mean, whoever's however long that's going to take, those people will have that. Um, 
staff will monitor that relative to the comments that we have received in, during the email process and over the static draft. If there are any recommend or comments that uh, are requests for changes that were not presented uh, following the public comment, we'll enter those to the commission for the record so that you'll have all the items that either we've received. Um, you'll also have that written, but you'll have all that. Chair will declare the public hearing closed, and uh, I've, I've listed out what this is. Basically, in accordance with Robert's rules of order, there needs to be a motion on the floor. And, and the reason is that Robert's calls for it. You can't really debate an item, a motion, until you have a motion on the floor. So there needs to be a motion and a second on the floor, and that gets the debate started. Uh, at that point in time, we would recommend a short oh, recess so that we can, and we will, be we will be copying all of these requests to speak forms through the night, through the evening, so we're not gonna go out and have to copy 100 of them. We'll be copying them as we go along, but we wanna make sure we have the last packet. Then what we're gonna do is to give you a list of all of the items that have been requested, and, and those are just, that'll just be a list of you know, one, two, three, four. They're, they're topics, whatever the people call. So if, you've, if, if somebody catches your attention, you need to write down what their item is so that, you know, that, that is something you wanna hear. The planning commissioners will have an opportunity that night to identify any items that it doesn't require a vote. Any commissioner can identify any items that you'd like to have the full commission discuss at the next meeting. There's not gonna be a vote on that. Um, and amendments can come from the list we give you or any amendment that you have. You may have amendments that you want on your own. Um, in accordance with the discussion we had the other day, we're, we're suggesting that at the end of the evening, you will have that list you will have taken some items off the list. You will have all of the requests to speak forms. And we'll let you, I mean, we, we suggest that up until Wednesday at noon, this will be Monday night, you'll have all day Tuesday and Wednesday morning. If you've got some other items, let us know so that we can, we can have those. So that's in there on, on this as part of item number 10. Um, then the chairman would basically um, continue the meeting to June 22nd and allow us time to, to prepare the, the motions or what the right motions, the right terminology or whatever for you to, to consider. On June 22nd, and then you go home <laughs> or whatever, you, you're, you leave here. Uh, then on June 22nd at one o'clock, June 20, the following Monday, then you reconvene and uh, the chair calls the meeting to order. Uh, the chair notes that the public hearing was closed um, notes that there was a motion to approve the plan on the floor, and then the, then the motion then your the motion on the floor is open for planning commission discussion. Um, to, we're anticipating that there could be a, ser a consent agenda of amendments where things have come up. Uh, we're in support of it and all that. So we'll try to, if, if there are, then we'll put a, a consent agenda together of amendments that uh, we'll present to the commission. And then you would begin to entertain the individual amendments that you've pulled off at that point in time. And we're suggesting if we can, we're not, we, we'll probably go through these, if they're elements or access items or community character manual items or whatever. We'll go through those first and then we'll go through the community plans. Um, and we'll list, we'll have the amendment, we'll try to show a map or show what, what the, it is on, on the screen. There needs to be a motion. If you want to debate that amendment, somebody needs to make a motion. So, so if there's no one that's willing to make a motion, then there's obviously not enough interest in it to debate that. If there's no motion, we go to the next item. And then if there's a motion in a second, then we'll stop, you debate it, you vote it up or down, and it goes on the list of, of amendments. After you've gone through all those, then, uh, then what you have is a, a, a motion for approval as amended with whatever amendments you have, then you vote on that main motion, it requires six votes to pass that, and then you're adjourned and leave. Rick, when you um, say there'd be a time block, they could come back a couple hours later. We're not gonna set up that they could come in four o'clock and say, I want to come back no. at 6.30. The first, if there's they, they two can, minutes each, the first 15 would be in the first 30 minutes, 
Right. Yeah, they've got. Yeah, yeah. You can't skip a block. Yeah. You can't, can't think, skip a block. Rick, would it help if we change the language to address that to say a minimum and a maximum of 18 will be signed up for each 30 minutes so that we don't start a new 30 minute block until we have 18 in the first one? Right. That's, that was our intent. Okay. I just yeah. think it might help because the okay. public has to see this and understand it yeah. if we said a minimum and a maximum of 18 will be signed up for each block. Okay. Yeah. Or we, we're going to sign about 18 per block. Yeah. Well, I yeah. just, we can okay. say it. That's All what right. I meant. So that clarifies your question. I mean, we don't, we don't want somebody coming thinking no. that they can do what Jim just said. <laughs> I'm good. We're going to be the one signing this. Yeah. They're not going to be able to. I realize that, but I mean, this is what we're putting out for the public for them to understand how we're proceeding. And so I think it's helpful that, that we're clear in how we're communicating what, how okay. it's going to happen. I right. agree. I understand technically what you're talking about, but I think we need to say it. That's all I meant. Okay. We got a few questions. Um, are we going to have the, um, the cool interactive before or after map available? Because if someone comes up and says, "I've got a property on Old Hickory Boulevard," <laughs> you know, picture this. We're going to have no idea what they're talking about. Um, I'm just curious if there was a way to easily identify so it's meaningful when we're hearing the comments to us because unless you know exactly where they're talking about it's going to go in in our in one ear and out the other is it possible no it, i think it's possible i think yeah yeah i think the commissioners need to i mean it, it's just up you're just going to have to figure out how you once you see that whether you get into a discussion or not at that point in time clearly we're going to do that on the second time but i understand whether we have the slider one or whether we just identify it it might be just identify where it is or something i understand why you'd like to know where it was so you'd understand better what they're saying yeah and and perhaps you know before the clock starts ticking they get the map up or, you know, I don't know if there's a way to do that. Well, we hope to. Well, yeah. let me make sure that I understand what you're requesting. Are you asking that we have a staff person here to, to ask them where the area They've is? They've already they signed up and written down where yeah. they're talking about, right? Yeah, they're, they're going to need to give us the They sheet. have to be descriptive on what their request is, right? Right. So when the staff's asking for them to fill this out, mm -hmm. I hope the staff will be saying, is there a particular property? you know, or parcel number or right, street area. intersection right. you know, somehow to identify it. Otherwise, okay. I don't know how we're going to do And that. then have someone here bringing that area right. up so that you've got it in front of you and you've got yeah, an idea. I, mean, I think for our sake to be able to record each one of these, they've got to put some sort of identifier on there. Right. Correct. Anyways, so okay. we would need to make sure they're doing that as they're filling it out. We had anticipated getting the forms from them as they came up, so we should, we'll, we'll have to figure out the logistics of that. But, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, just to be clear, our rules around neighborhood associations, someone representing a, a larger organization. Um, no, two minutes per, this, this proposes two minutes per person. Right. So Period. a neighborhood association would get five? Two. Okay. They couldn't say we're under the, representing under the, the this, the, under this special rule. Right. That we haven't voted on yet. Right. Okay. It's one person. Right. And then, um, I suspect we'll have people with multiple requests. Uh, multiple observations, especially some of the neighborhood advocates that, you know, are going to look very closely at this. They may have three or four issues that they want to raise, and does that mean there's 30 seconds per issue? Uh, or uh, Under the current proposed rules, that means that they need to be judicious with their time. <laughs> That's what, I just wanted to raise that to make sure that well, I think that'll likely happen. And they can also submit it in writing during this month yeah. that the staff will be collecting all the comments online. And, and you'll have all that, right? And we'll have the staff will be presenting that to us as well. True. So they may have submitted six things, but they may choose in their two minutes to only talk about two of them. Right. But we'd still get their input, right? Correct. They or they might get it. different people to talk about different items. Yeah. Right. And we understand if someone um, makes the comment that, you know, there's too much, uh, too many tall skinnies being built, but that's not a proposed amendment, right? I mean, that gets scratched off the, I mean, we'll hear that and we may, but, the, but if they're just in general commenting, we've had too much infill or there's too much density or, you know, you, we want more well, density. You know, traffic's a problem. Or traffic's a problem. Children we're going to hear that. Yes. Now we're going to hear very sure. general comments. <laughs> Um, that aren't specific around any particular property well, or report. For the public. 
There is an option to choose general comment or request a change. Yeah. And so if they just okay. have a comment that they want to make to tell us what their feelings are, we can hear it, and they right. can check call it a general comment. If, so is if that, they say there's too much traffic on that would be a Nolan's general comment. Pike, that's a general comment. <laughs> that's my guess. Okay. It, Regardless, you may not, I mean, if, if unless, I mean, <coughs> I understand the dilemma, but... A commissioner could pull that off and say there might be too much traffic. We need to change this from, you know, from okay. urban to rural. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Is this on the website? It will be when it, when you approve it. Right, but once it's approved, it's yes. on the website, so there can be some kind of notification that yes. people. So people, and maybe we put something there that says you will be limited to two minutes, regardless of how many items you wish to present. Or well, we tried to say each person may address the commission once. All comments will be limited to two minutes. Okay. <laughs> and it says it on the form as well. Yeah, right. Okay. So essentially, we, we as um, sort of commissioners can pick up anything we hear from them and try to turn that into a, an amendment. Mm -hmm. Or we can come up with our own from today right. on. We don't have to wait to that hearing. Right. Uh, so if we hear a general comment and we become convicted that this needs to get interpreted in some way, in a specific way, because it is about more than just a property and what the property, what the general plan is for the property. So that uh, we have a larger responsibility here than we sometimes do. Um, I just we, we do have that flexibility as commissioners, right? right. Mm -hmm. We could be thinking about amendments right now, and we could be modifying what we hear or or not if we don't think they're good ideas. I That's, mean, you may have. I mean, we tried to word it to you know. You may have heard something during the workshops that, that yeah. concern you that doesn't come up ever at this, but it bothered you, right. right? You clearly can do that. And after we read cover to cover, you know. How many several thousand times. pages? Several times. I'm sure we'll have to. You've already read it. Volume one, volume two, and I'm volume four are up, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Other questions, comments on I the procedure? Had, sorry, I have one, a couple more, maybe. Um, on the second page, it looked like there was a sentence that wasn't didn't continue planning. Is there something missing? No, it goes here? on the next page. That's just the, it goes to the footnote at the bottom. Go, go. To, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. right. That's the first word. Yeah. Next sentence. Okay. Um, Okay, and then if uh, on the, at the second meeting, and I think we talked a little bit about this at the workshop, at, at the second meeting, um, we'll make individual motions on each amendment that we decide to hear. Every amendment that you have, we'll prepare. Yeah, it'll be on the list and it'll come up. And again, if someone, we'll basically outline it. You know, this was a request to, to amend the health and livabilities element to this way. And somebody, and y'all, you know, is there a motion? And if there's, and that doesn't, I mean, if all the motion means, a motion a second means you're going to discuss it. Yeah. If there's not a motion, then you, okay, there wasn't there, then you go to the next time. And if, and if there's a motion to defer that <laughs> amendment, I know I'm imagining we don't have enough information, we have some questions for the staff, um, then would that come back later or is that essentially just taking it off? Well, I mean, I think that you clearly could direct staff to prepare amendments to that for later consideration, uh, unless it's a big issue. I mean, I mean, I would not suggest that you amend that you to defer the whole plan, but you could defer. <laughs> you could, do, you know, you could say, yeah, That's we want this. Yeah, clearly, you could do that. Yeah. And then would that yeah. come up at just a, a regular meeting at another time yeah. as part of our agenda? Yeah. Uh, as far as the. Uh, elements, yes, I, I can see that yeah. coming up and being deferred. But as far as the actual policies themselves, uh, the land use policies, I, I, um, I mean, and we there need to talk to about be a that policy in place. No, no, yeah, right. There needs to be a policy in place. You might want to direct us to do something, or it would be almost like a housekeeping amendment. We can't, amendment. We can't yeah. move forward without no policy. direction yeah. of some be, policy. It wouldn't be a deferral because there's nothing to in a way, right? It's, you don't have an amendment. We, we have to have a policy in place. For but we could direct the staff just, to prepare additional information and bring an, a, a proposed amendment back for us to consider yeah. later at some point outside of the Nashville Next. If you did that, then I would encourage you that if the, 
any parts of the land use policies that are proposed uh, you want to defer, then I would state that you, you should say that you're you're leaving the land use policy as it is, uh, but you would want the proposed right. changes to be back, brought back at a later date. You, yeah, you don't want to you do nothing, do but I think the bottom line is the current policy would be the, poli the defective. defective. Yeah. But I would want that stated on the yeah. record that that's clear that the current policy is to remain until whatever was deferred is brought back and, right. and the commission considers it. Okay. Yeah. Which is sort of the opposite because of everything else, the, the uh, default to the proposed policy. I mean, under the motion, the default is the proposed policy. Right. Except for when you're doing the general plan, right, it would... No, I'm, no I mean, all the other policies are the, def the default under the motion of approval. Well, yeah, I mean, the motion is to approve so all the new policies. policies. Right. So we've got to pull the proposed right. policy Correct. out in order... Right. To defer because your initial motion is to approve. Right, that's what. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. And okay. sorry. I just no, no, it's no, that's, that's exactly what well, we want to do tonight. And with that, with that, I'm thinking of the timing on the ground for the people who then have that policy in place. It's in place then to get permits or things drawn on or proposals done until some time that we might discuss it and amend it in the future, and then it would change within some time frame? Well, I mean, until you change it, to, I mean, uh, the, the current, the, today's policy is going to be in effect until you change it. This motion will change it. We'll make, I mean, yeah. Okay. I mean, no, clearly, just, after you know, after you adopt it, if you have these that are in this deferral state and you're looking at them, obviously, an applicant could bring a change amendment sure. to amend the plan. So, Rick, the um, meetings that we should have cleared our calendars for and should have written in on our calendars are what? June fifteenth, beginning at three o'clock, and June twenty second, beginning at one o'clock. No June 10th. No June 10th. Anymore. No. And that's been distributed to us. Yeah. It's, that's it. No. Yeah. I'll, I'll make sure everybody still has it. I, I know it was at your desk this yeah, morning. It was the revised one. It was the revised okay, one. Because this was at the desk, too. Well, okay. yeah, because we went right. through two or three revised ones. All right. Just wanted to be yeah. sure we had it. There's one that says revised May 13th, 2015. That's the one that's important. But we also have... We also, um, what your name is down there, Mr. Clifton. We also have a regular meeting on June 11th. Remember? We do. We, we do. Have a regular meeting. We have a regular meeting. So, uh, could I move we adopt the proposed red uh, procedure? With uh, my post? with my change. Yes. Please. Yeah, with whatever she said there. Well, I have some question about. Are we? Do we have a second? Which change was it? Her change was a minimum and a maximum of 18. And did anything I ask suggest a change to this or just clarify how we're going to proceed? I, I, I didn't hear anything that wasn't, I didn't think was not covered in here. Well, it, was, yeah, I, I took everything you've asked so far as just clarification. Yeah. I, I, I do wonder if you want something for a neighborhood association to say. Oh. If you want something... We still um, don't have a second, just as a side note. Um, you don't have a second? Oh, we don't have a second. Okay. I'll second. Okay. I'm wondering if we do want to consider the opportunity for a neighborhood association to have more time if they are speaking on behalf of the association. So we don't have an entire street coming forward to say the same thing. That's up to... I mean, it's obviously something you can do. Um, it, it's a matter of policing that. Yeah. I mean, what we've seen, what will happen is in some neighborhoods, you'll get the entire street will come out and say something. And it's about the same thing. I mean, I just think... I think, I think over the history we've seen where the neighborhood association will come and speak and then you will still get yeah. everybody <laughs> on the street to come speak. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do this, yeah. but I think we've seen it both ways. Okay. 
And the chairman's been pretty successful at monitoring that. <laughs> we got a motion to second. So we we'll, don't hear the motion again. State the motion. Who made the motion? The, the motion was to approve with uh, the clarification from uh, Commissioner LaCroix that we have 18 minimum and maximum. Okay. Got a motion, second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Procedures are now in place. Now, Hunter. Are we on the are we at the end of the agenda? Yeah, you want to say something about the start? And it that would, was just raised and something I think about often that we haven't talked about in a long time. But, but the question of, and I, that maybe this is something we can put on another agenda for us to discuss, but under our, our rules, um, the question of when a neighborhood association is represented by a board member or the president and they voted to support or to oppose a, a project, um, in my mind, that's never meant that if you live in that neighborhood or are even a member of that neighborhood, that your uh, opportunity to share your public comment is denied. I've never, I don't think we should or maybe even can deny someone that opportunity. Uh, and I don't know, this may be something that we should debate some other day or talk about some other day. But related to that is the question of when an applicant comes and their project team speaks, you know, either as part of the 10 minutes or we've had examples where the project team speaks for two minutes following, which I don't think is really the intent. I think it's, if you're think, you know, if you're part of the project team, you should be using right. part of the 10 minutes. But that doesn't always happen either. So um, so I just want to make sure that our rules are clear and that if we need to need to clarify those or make sure that, you know, team applicants aren't taking advantage of the two minute rule. Um, I've also heard other commissioners before question whether someone from a neighborhood should be speaking if their neighborhood associated or association had already spoken. And I, personally, I don't think our rule suggests that you can't speak if you want to as an individual. So I just wanted to bring it up, and if we need to discuss it further or clarify or, or maybe bring the rule to us, you know, I know we've got it here, but if we want to put it on the agenda at a future meeting so we can all have time to really look at the rule and see if it needs to be tweaked just to be clear and then how we enforce that regularly. I just wanted to suggest that. So, Mr. Chairman, could we I put that I, on I think on it is agenda? confusing because yes. I think I remember that if the five-minute person were there, that meant people from that neighborhood didn't speak. But I think de facto, when people show up, we've let them speak because they're here and we feel like they've made an effort and they're part of the public process. So that's I mean, it, it tending to be how we've done it, I think. It might discourage people. I mean, or it might uh, encourage people to uh, show some restraint and not speak. But I, I don't like the idea of, you know, if someone feels like they, they should... They shouldn't walk away from here feeling okay. like they've been I, and denied I, and the I, opportunity to speak. And I think that's why we've done it. The, I mean, our chair has handled it that way, let them speak. I think almost, I mean, I don't think we've ever denied anybody the right to speak okay. who's been here. We, we, <laughs> we do need to bring it up, and, and this might be the best time to do it. I had a discussion the other day with some of the staff about whether we wanted to do the retreat, although Carl's going out of office. But I don't think that should preclude us from having our retreat because there's other items that, that are very important, whether he's a mayor or not. But try to do it before he goes out of office where he can be there and we can tell him our appreciation for his leadership. So is there anyone that thinks we shouldn't have the retreat? And then I'll get, if not, I'll get uh, Kelly, if you will, to let's see when the mayor would be available. And we're probably talking about late July or into August possibly and then we put hundred we'll ask for items to be put on for discussion and that's when I would need to do it yeah one thing I want to be sure that we and be sure I'm correct in saying this but that the Nashville next plan is um, it's not stopping on the day that we approve it it's a it gets public input it gets Revisit it every year to think about how it was working or what needs to be changed, and it's it's not a it's not the last 
second the public will get to speak about these issues. And right. I feel like we've gotten a lot of feedback with that resistance or frustration. And so my question would be, if I'm correct in that, could we be sure that it, at the staff presentation that be really loud and clear that this is not the last second the public is going to get to speak and that it's always going to be a fluid? A absolutely. I think at the presentation we'll talk about uh, it's a living document. I mean, as much as any document that Metro uses, it is, and that it is ever-changing. Uh, and uh, we will discuss how we, some of the steps we plan to do implementation uh, in, in the days literally after uh, National Next is adopted. So we'll make sure that we emphasize that in the presentation. I just think that communication will help engender a lot more trust in the process if we can keep saying that. <laughs> Thank you. And I think it also goes the other way in that um, the fact that we will have just adopted the general plan for our entire county doesn't suggest that um, we got it all perfect and we got it all right. And so we will see community plan amendments come, you know, shortly after we adopt this, and it would be easy to say, well, hey, we just changed this. Why would, why would we be, not, why are we even entertaining it? Um, and so, you know, I think it's sort of the, the flip side of it, you know. Good. No, I agree, and I think that it's, it's really important. Part of the plan includes an annual report and evaluation to this commission. Mm -hmm. So in addition to, as Doug said, moving into implementation and seeing amendments and all that, uh, it'll hopefully be a living document in, in as many ways as we can come up to be a living document. Uh, Walter, you have anything from the courthouse? Okay. Hunter, anything on this start? Any other comments? Or well, we stand adjourned. Awesome. Thank you.